Hey everyone, uh, before we start today's episode, I wanted to quickly tell you about the membership drive that I am doing on patreon.com slash fire these times to celebrate over two years of this podcast. If we hit the goal of 100 new supporters at $5 or more a month or 50 a year, I'll be able to hire a producer, which would give me more time to focus on the research and interviews and actually start releasing two episodes a week instead of one. If you become a supporter, in addition to getting early access to all episodes, you will also have access to our monthly hangout in which myself and everyone else who supports this project come together and chat about pretty much everything. Um, It happens every month on a Saturday and you have access to the link and everything related to that uh, on Patreon. And lastly, if you cannot donate, you can still support by sharing this podcast with your friends and families and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts. This helps get more exposure to this podcast and introduce it to more folks. You can also follow this podcast and project on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Substack, and of course, the main website. So thanks again, everyone, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm the guy behind the YouTube channel Andrewism, pronounce he, him. I am an anarchist from Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm just really passionate about a lot of stuff. I'm Emmy. I live in Aotearoa, and my pronouns are they, them. And yeah, I'm just a big old nerd. I don't know. We'll see what happens. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, okay, I'm Joey. I mean, I guess you, you folks know this since you're listening to my podcast. He, him. I'm currently in uh, Switzerland for various reasons that are at best mildly interesting. And (laughs) yeah, I'm also into a lot of stuff that we'll definitely get into. And I, so both Andrew and Emmy were guests on this podcast separately uh, in the past. And I wanted to get them back on to talk about sort of like our separate journeys, if that's the right term. And I'm going to say if that's the right term a lot of the time, because I'm very confused about vocab most of the time. But uh, on like what got us uh, quote unquote radicalized. And I guess a way to start is just really whatever comes to mind. <laughs> uh, and I, sh- I should say this is kind of cool. Like we're actually chatting around uh, across three very different timelines. I'm recording this at like 10 p.m. Uh, Emmy, I don't know, 8 a.m. or something. Yeah, 8 a.m. And Andrew, I have no idea. 2 p.m. or something. I have no idea. I'm guessing. 4 p.m. 4 p.m. <laughs> well, I mean, cl- close enough, whatever. Um, how, okay. So let me ask you this super vague question just because I'm not entirely sure how to start exactly, but how would you say, or what, how would you describe your trajectory in the sense of like, in terms of how you see yourself having gotten radicalized at some point in your past? And I'm not going to say like Andrew or Emmy, like whatever, whoever wants to start, just go for it. Right. Well, for me, at least, I think it just started with I mean, my natural curiosity, I've always been very um, passionate about exploring all the different subjects and ideas and concepts and things that are out there. Um, I started reading from a very early age. I started writing from a very early age, inventing stories, creating whole worlds and characters and places um, to sort of lay out all these ideas I had about how I could make the world better. And that is was and is my goal to try and make the world better and so i was definitely i would say misled a bit um i wouldn't say misled um misled i guess um (laughs) in terms of (laughs) the direction at least at least you know early on um i had a bit of a hiccup due to my um past you know religious background it was a very conservative environment but I came out of that because I felt that something wasn't right. I I had a sense of empathy and a sense of morality that was derived from, you know, I wouldn't say it was entirely um, organic. I would say that, you know, even though I came to disagree with my past beliefs, they did facilitate that somewhat. Um, I basically came to the realization that, empathy is really the path forward and and these these ideas that I was being told were you know love and and truth and all these different things I I realized they did not align 
with what I saw to be love and what I saw to be truth. And so coming out of that, I still had this, you know, voracious appetite for knowledge and for truth and for ideas and concepts. And so that led me, and of course, I still had my active imagination and that led me in the direction of anarchism. What about you, Amy? Yeah, so Andrew, first of all, I just want to say it's a really beautiful story um, and well told. And I guess I was just going to say first, that was a very beautiful story, very well told. And I, I, I respect um, your intellectual curiosity and the Thank bravery you. of kind of, you know, being able to peek above the clouds in the context that you live. Um, it's not an easy task. And also, I really appreciate that you held on to these specific values of like truth and love and empathy, but that they took you outside of the framework in which they were introduced to you. That's like quite interesting to me um, and something I can kind of relate to. Um, I didn't come up from a religious background or a particularly conservative background. Um, I don't know. I feel like the story of radicalization for me is just the story of my life, which would be too long for a podcast. <laughs> Um, it's the story of all the relationships I've had, all the people I've respected, all the things that have happened to me, all the things that I've seen, the things that have happened to the people I love. Um, so for me, it really feels like a process of relation. Um, although sometimes I feel quite alone in the sort of heterodox um, practices and beliefs that I hold, um, just because eventually you get to a point where you're you're creating your own thing. You're not like bound to uh, representing some popular idea. You just have to be honest with yourself. Mm. Um, and so I feel like I identified as an anarchist for more than a decade and I'm certainly still influenced by it, but I don't really take on political labels as, I try not to take them on as identities, just kind of as some sort of thing about how my brain works that f that feels unhealthy to how my brain works um so i think of things as influences and tools um i was influenced a lot by a lot of kind of global south um radicals pocs that i that i was working with or hanging out with or learning from in in the bay area of california um before that i was just kind of like doing my own thing you know, reading, nerding on the internet and stuff, but having these kind of communities like that had a big impact on me. And they were kind of like subsistence socialists, a lot of them. But at the same time, I was like, I was like homeless. So I was living in, you know, hanging out in all these anarchist squats and stuff and, you know, working with these different anarchist projects. I became very interested in prison abolition. I had both like these kind of like global south socialist E types that were really rad. And then I had like these prison abolition friends. And then I had like these squatter anarchist friends. And I feel like I was learning from and with all of them in different ways. Um, and then I just went through, I don't know, I, I, I lived in a lot of like quite poor, quite, I, I lived around a lot of police violence. Um, and that certainly had a big impact on me being like young and trans and homeless and stuff. Um, and so I just went through a lot of different phases in my political evolution, like generally being focused around some specific topic um, and then building out conclusions from that. You know, like I was really into prison abolition for a while and then I became really into restorative justice, transformative justice. And then, and then I started dealing a lot in terms of like violent conflict and then I became quite focused on anti-fascism and now I'm quite invested in sort of the information warfare landscape and combating white supremacist movements um and and now I yeah I think Joey and I have both been kind of impacted and mortified by the scale of state-backed disinformation campaigns especially around Syria and then that led us to build relationships with people in like Hong Kong and now the Ukrainian crisis um, who were experiencing similar stuff. Um, and so, uh, yeah, now living in Aotearoa, I feel like the, the main lens here 
of all politically radical groups is decolonization. I feel like it's not that it wasn't in the U.S., but that, that there's more indigenous political power here um, because this country was formed by a treaty. So Maori forced the crown into treating here. So that's the founding document of the country. And you can sue against the version that's in Te Reo Māori um, for land back and things like that. So, so now I feel like I'm in this point in my life where I'm just like, I don't feel as certain as I did when I was younger about all of my politics. I feel very humbled by the scale of violence and crises that we face. I have beliefs that I hold very strongly, but I have a lens of uncertainty around pretty much all of them. And I'm just like in a position to be learning a lot, I think, all the time. Oh, and my last little thing about radicalization, I don't mind that word. I actually like it. I just don't like when people apply it to a horseshoe. Like, Hmm. um, Because I don't think that being far right is particularly radical in the sense of getting at the roots, like in the etymology of the word radical and what it actually means. Uh, I just think it's brash and incoherent. So I try not to give them that power. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, honestly, so, I hear lots. Of, yeah, go for it, Andrew. Sorry. So just before you, you get into your, your story, Joey, I just wanted to respond to one thing that Emmy had said. Um, when they were talking about identity and labels and, you know, identifying a particular political program and, you know, viewing that as unhealthy. Um, I personally, like, I get that. I, I still say that I'm an anarchist, but I do get that as well. And it's actually the whole reasoning behind why my channel is called Andrewism, because I wanted my channel to just be a sort of a record of my political journey, um, sort of a, a public exploration of ideas and how those ideas synthesize my own brain, you know, and my own experiences, my own context, all, you know, mixed in together. That is what Andrewism is. And so what I think more people should be encouraging is just this approach to politics that is more personalized hmm. in terms of belief systems and how you apply it to your own life. That's really beautiful. Yeah, I don't treat my like, my rejection of labels, I worry is like a little bit hipster. And I don't treat it as like an ultimate way that other people should interact. It's literally just particular to my I have like OCD, among other things. And I just get hung up on the implications of labels in ways that are time wasters. (laughs) And so I just don't want to feel like I'm living up to an ideology. I would much rather be curious about what I deeply feel in my intuition. You know what I mean? And whatever that looks like, I don't want to play to a political team. Right. But yeah, your your approach to it is very is resonates a lot. Yeah, it makes sense. I I I do kind of like I had William Anderson on. He wrote this book on black anarchism called The Nation on No Map, and he quoted uh another person whose name I'm spacing out on, but essentially uh, saying like, I don't run from it. So I don't run from the label of anarchism, but I don't run to it either. So it's just, it's for me, I, I kind of see it as one category that I'm very familiar with. It's a framework of viewing the world in many ways. It's very useful. Uh, it has its limitation as with anything really. And so sometimes I, if I kind of approach a certain topic, I approach it in an anarchist way, if that makes sense. And other times, like in a feminist way. And not that these two are contradictory, obviously. For me, they're they're very much not. But it's like, oh, this is, I'm I'm approaching this topic from a certain language, certain framework that is mostly um, explained, if you want, by people who identify as feminists or by people who identify as anarchists or or whatever. Um, And so, like, my own. background i mean yeah yeah, i mean as with both of you it's just kind of going to be a summary but i feel like just going up in lebanon alone uh is bound to make you either curious about the world or extremely cynical about the world and personally um i i 
I definitely went into the cynical side at some point in, in the past. And I think my rebelliousness phase, if we want to call it that, um, I may want to get into it a bit more because I know, Andrew, you mentioned somewhere else, like, I mean, you mentioned here as well, obviously, right? Like the um, having kind of conservative background and at some point, at least flirting with right wing ideas or however we want to call it. In my case, it was, um, it wasn't quite framed in a right wing sense, but ultimately I think it was. And that's because I really got into when I was like in my teenage years, I got into like the new atheists as they were called at the time. And that's like, you know, the Sam Harris, the Dawkins, uh, Christopher Hitchens, that sort of those sorts of guys and Daniel Dennett. And the reason in retrospect why that was the case is that the rebelliousness aspect of it is that I grew up in a context where religion is extremely politicized. Uh, well, arguably that's always the case, but in Lebanon, I would say it, particularly concentrated and that was my way of sort of uh, you know saying fuck that or fuck all of it essentially and so i would be yeah it, there was a sense of um i don't know if there was emancipation per se that's probably a bit too much but there was a sense of kind of freeing myself from uh, i also went to like a private catholic school and you know there was like uh, i don't know how to say it in english but like catechese which is like catholic studies uh, every wednesday and every friday there was church and, you know, the uh, chemistry teacher was a priest and, you know, that was that that entire vibe. And so that was for me a way of of um, rejecting that. But uh, that same gang, that same group of people, especially some Harris sense, obviously, and usually I don't name names, but I, and I, but I don't really care in this case. Uh, but like that same gang sort of also got into right wing stuff in Europe and, and in the US. Obviously, Hitchin supported the war in Iraq. Um, I forgot what the other, some of them supported like the far right in, in the Netherlands, you know, that sort of thing. And obviously there was a, a underlying Islamophobia throughout their entire uh, worldview, which I never fully shared. But I think when I was young, I wasn't smart enough to entirely reject it either. And so that, but that was in my teenage years. And I'm not entirely sure what happened that got me out of it. Partly, I think it was just boredom. I'm also very curious and I wanted to explore other stuff. And so at some point I just got bored of reading their stuff. And I went to do something else. But then the other thing is that, as I said, just being in Lebanon and going to university in 2011, uh, which is when the Arab Spring started. So that was, I think, almost inevitably going to, not inevitably, that's maybe a bit too much, but like definitely steered me towards that direction. I, I love this idea of ADHD basically as a pathway out of like reactionary ideology. <laughs> Lean in. <laughs> Get get through the mimetic virus. Get bored. Move on. That checks yeah. out. Same. I was kind Let's of a hit nerd for a minute uh, too. I've believed all kinds of weird things yeah. just because that's how I have to get through an idea. Is I have to fully chew it, you know, and then the other side. Of yeah, I get. I actually get that. I get that. Um, yeah. No. Okay. So the the other thing was just. I mean, the other thing, the next, the next sort of question, I have these sort of titles in front of me of like themes to explore, but as usual on this podcast kind of go, goes all over the place. But um, I wonder if you can, the two of you can sort of speak to uh, a bit more in any case to like the experience of growing up, if you can sort of take a, a step back, if that's at all possible. I mean, maybe it's a bit easier for you because you're not in the US anymore, but uh, Andrew, you're in Trinidad. But like, so how would you describe as much as you can, uh, what it was like to grow up in Trinidad or what it was like to grow up in the US and how do you think that affected, and I know this is super vague, but I mean, the question is kind of broad, but how do you think that affected your politics? I think being in Trinidad um, influenced my politics in the sense of, well, regardless of um, my family's political, religious, because I mean, the politics and the religion came in a package. But regardless of that background, they still had a sense of anti-colonial politic. Um, and that is something that I think you would find in most people, regardless of their political orientation, just by virtue of, you know, coming from, you know, our history and our context as a colonized nation. So despite perhaps having a certain perspective on capitalism be beforehand and having certain views on like um, 
feminism or whatever the case may be, I still had this sense of opposition to, you know, these imperial powers that, you know, drove um, us into the circumstances we're in today. And so I think that, for one, definitely influences things. Coming from an afro trinidadian background in particular, um, and just having a, a sense of our history would have also played a, a role. Um, I think that my experience in the country, at least, would be a bit more, at least in the early stages, was a bit more sheltered because um, I had gone to school, yes, but only up until a certain point. And then from there, I was homeschooled and, and schooled myself and sort of navigated um, my preteens and, and teens um, in a home education context. So I would say that there were elements of, of, of life and, and reality that I would not have experienced the, the full breadth of, but I would say that I did get a good sense of, of life for the average Trinidadian, um, a, a good sense of, of the culture and sort of seeing how some of these things, some of these ideas that the people hold, um, the suffering that people face, it, it helps me to get a sense of the necessity of significant change. Being of my generation and being in the global south, I also had a sense of impending climate collapse from a very early age. And so I was already, I was already in the process of, you know, seeking solutions to that. Um, I already had this sense of like a, a ticking clock, you know, of, you know, time being up at some point. And so I think that also guided my politics because, you know, I still had that sense of environmentalism. I mean, I did also have like a pretty international outlook in terms of, you know, my education and um, the breadth of, of sort of books that I had read. Um, and when I say that I was home school, I don't mean to imply that I was literally at home all the time because I did have a lot of experience um, socializing and interacting with people of a lot of different backgrounds. Um, so I think I, I think growing up in Trinidad just gave me a sense of all of the ways that colonialism affects like a society, all of the ways that, you know, people cope and adapt and, and deal with the traumas intergenerational and, and so forth that such a system, you know, would have introduced. And so I think that even now, just, you know, traveling or just living life, seeing how people interact, seeing the news, seeing the culture, seeing all these different circumstances, it's just that realization of the breadth and scope and, and depths of colonialism's impact you know it it, it makes me it, it gives me a, a good recognition of how arduous and how lengthy and how um multifaceted the process of decolonization will need to be to facilitate healing, to, you know, bring us to a place of strength and equality and autonomy and, you know, all of the values that I hold so dear. That's amazing. I mean, what about you? And the yeah, players? so... It's going to be funny talking to you too because I like I grew up in the heart of empire. You know, <laughs> uh, Lebanon is a country ravaged by US foreign policy. 
is one of the top militaries that, you know, other than Israel, that the U.S. government and State Department have funded. And it's this site of contention. Um, and I know less about the history of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so, yeah, but... Tobago. Yeah, Tobago. I actually knew that as soon as I said it, sorry. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so growing up in the U.S., I don't know how to say this right, but the U.S., like being white in the U.S. especially, is a form of psychosis. Like, I say that in the sense of, um, like Amy Césaire and Franz Fanon both talked about, like, the, the psychosis caused by the violence of being a slaver and basically how it destroyed people's minds that that degree of attempted power and violence like deeply messed up their ability to be a basically a human being at the most fundamental level and hmm. being in empire in the heart of empire there's like an aspect of that like i grew up very in in very racially culturally diverse settings um like the us is such a big place you'll talk to white people who basically didn't know a person of color until they went to college or something like that. That was not my experience. Um, I was exposed to a pretty wide body of people. And also I had lived in like, I have lived in from like lower middle class to like upper lower class in the U S but we've definitely experienced a lot of poverty at different times a lot of chaos moving all around the country. Um, and yeah, so basically the U.S. projects power all over the world, destroys societies, commits genocide, but then it also doesn't give a fuck about anybody in the U.S. aside from like certain privileged groups. And so you kind of get a sense of that constantly. Um, and then like as i got older and i had more and more experiences like i'm a very sensitive person you know growing up i got called a faggot a lot <laughs> because i cried and i have a lot of feelings and mm. i see other people having a lot of feelings and i have a lot of feelings so living in different contexts and seeing people have experiences that were different than my own certainly impacted me a lot um you know like like, you know, I, I saw a pretty intense uh, example of police violence went in San Francisco at one point and I tried to engage and like, it was like a really volatile situation. And, you know, and I just like cried for weeks, not framing like my experience of that as the worst ex person's experience of that. Obviously the worst person's experience of that was the target of police violence, it wasn't me. Um, but stuff like that in the U.S. like really impacted my view. Um, and I guess I started believing pretty young that my freedom was entangled with other people's, like especially coming out as trans and like, like living in homeless shelters and stuff and having a lot of like black and brown trans femme community and like sex work community and stuff like that there was really practical in ways in which like our mutual aid was critical for each other. And so it made it really obvious that, that our, our freedoms were entangled, but it also made me realize like more about what it meant to be white. Like even in a highly precarious situation, there was still certain like forms of white privilege that I could try to leverage. Um, just knowing how to care in different systems basically and feeling entitled to do so. And so, yeah, I, I feel like I had to come to terms with that. And I feel like I've had a lot of very patient friends and lovers over my life <laughs> who've like taught me a lot about myself and the space that I hold. Um, yeah, so now living not in the US anymore I feel like I went through an experience of 
so much of what was latent in the U.S. or was the violence of the U.S. that was being exercised constantly is exploding in this more public way right now along the lines of the global far-right power grab that's happening. Um, and being outside of the U.S., it just feels like leaving an abuser that's constantly trying to get you back. Like, <laughs> there's like this parable in Spanish, I've only heard it in the Mexican context, uh, about like crabs trying to crawl out of a boiling pot of water and they keep trying to pull you back in because each one's trying to escape. And so trying to escape, they pull you back into the hot water and nobody escapes. That's really how I feel about the U.S. It's just like a deeply unwell place that's falling apart at the seams. And the individualism just tears people apart. And so you have to like loving very deeply in the U.S. is a weirdly radical thing because you're not really supposed to build these deep meshes of resilient community. Um, and so there's like a counter, there's like a slightly countercultural aspect of doing so. But then at the same time, I've lived in places in the U.S., like in southern Arizona, where there was just huge, deeply developed radical community um, with tons of systems and projects. And like, you know, I basically everyone I knew was was involved in radical political activism and we all had shared language and. I don't know, the U.S. is just a real complicated place. And so now that I'm away from it, I feel like I'm emotionally processing a persistent trauma. Um, and not framing that trauma as like the ultimate trauma that you can experience. Obviously, it's a very privileged country to live. Um, but <laughs> I feel like living in Aotearoa is like, there's like a lot of things that it's many, many problems, but there's a lot of things that just make more sense. Like this is a really silly example, but um, like the word collective housing has a very different implication here in the U S sharing groceries, like doing your grocery shopping together is like this commune esque hippie thing. Um, that's like, Ooh, wow. We, we bought our groceries together. You know, it's like intentional housing and things like this. Whereas in New Zealand, it's just like, people are like, oh yeah, that's what being a roommate is. <laughs> so if someone says that they're in a collective housing situation here, it's actually way more intense in my experience because there's like more of that general culture of connecting. Um, yeah, so I feel like the US lies and you internalize those lies when you live there. Uh, and so part of living in the US is, is trying to break away from those lies and the harms that they cause by having empathy, basically, as Andrew would frame it. Mm. I don't know. I don't really know how to explain this shit no, because I'm still in the middle did, of it. I think you did honestly read it well. So let me. Okay, so I'll only mention one aspect of going up in Lebanon, which I just think is most interesting to our conversation, because I, I think I've, I talk about Lebanon way too much already on this podcast. Um, but it's just the, the overwhelming presence and awareness of borders. And that's something I never quite understood. So Lebanon, for those who don't know, only has two neighbors. It's a very tiny country. Um, but it has two neighbors that are either bigger and or more powerful. And those two neighbors are Syria and Israel. Um, not the easiest neighbors to have, uh, granted. Um, and I, I never quite understood how internalized my, um, close, I mean, I think it's a form of, honestly, I think I would describe it as claustrophobia and how internalized it became and how why for example when i was living in scotland at some point i felt so freer it's because there was there wasn't really any borders anywhere near i mean there was the english one but that doesn't really count because it's the uk anyway uh well for now <laughs> um but it, it i was always 
yeah, I felt much, much more comfortable there because you can go, you know, north and you can go south and no one will stop you because you, it's an island, right? So, but the first, before, like long before that, I would visit Europe a lot uh, because I have family here. And I remember, I very clearly remember the first time, or at least one of the first times I crossed a border. And that was bef- between Switzerland and France. Um, and I I just remember being just amazed that nothing happened because for the most part, the borders are just there and they're not, you know, sometimes there are checks, but the checks are just kind of a formality. If you have papers, obviously, if you don't have papers, it's a much different problem. Um, but on mostly the roads we were taking stuff, like it's just, it's not, it's not a thing. Essentially, like people just, you have people who live across the border and they forget that the border is there. They only remember if it's like a different currency because Switzerland and France have different currencies. Or, you know, whatever, like there's a flag somewhere or whatever, something that reminds you that you're now in a different uh, nation state. Well, in Lebanon, that is impossible. Uh, if you go to the south and then you decide you want to go further south, you get shot at. Well, I think it's physically impossible to do so anyway, but if you manage somehow, you get shot at. And if you want to go to, you know, Syria, that's, you know, d- dangerous for, for very different reasons, especially if you're an activist like me. Not to so, mention that Lebanon was occupied by Syria. Yeah, yeah. So that's the other thing. Thanks. I mean, like Lebanon at some point was occupied by both Israel and Syria at the same time. Uh, they co-occupied Lebanon for for like, uh, I, what, 18 years, uh, more or less in total together uh, ish. Um, Israel between 82 and 2000, although they, they had a small occupation before that and Syria between, well, I don't quite know when to start Syria, but roughly between 76 and 2005, more or less. Um and so that that that's always something that, and I think that's something that many people in Lebanon gr- grew up with, but don't necessarily because it's internalized. And I had to go through a process. I, I'm literally doing a PhD on the shit. I had to go through a process of taking a step back, and that that's what um, first Scotland, but especially Switzerland's been for me. Because as far as things happening on a daily basis, it's like as opposed, like as not Lebanon as it gets. And that I found um, kind of, yeah, it allowed me to just have, take a step back and kind of care for myself a bit more in the past couple of years, even though it's been a pandemic, obviously, but. I, I, it's funny that you bring that up. I don't know why I didn't think of it sooner, but yeah, living on the Turkish Syrian border and also living on the US Mexico border, deeply, deeply changed the way that I think about the world. It's not like I didn't have a critique of nation states, but the sort of liminality and mixing and violent imaginary constructions of the places. Um, yeah, it really drove home like freedom of movement for me and feeling like Border Patrol was a fascist occupation, like a low-key terror organization. Um, so yeah. And yeah. I think, um, I think another aspect of really highlighting the violence of borders and just the inanity of borders, um, for a lot of people, for those who don't live in those environments, um, it's something I, I, I brushed against recently is just the whole visa application process, particularly in entering the U S even just to visit. It's just utterly absurd. Yep. I remember when I was actually in the in the line for my visa interview because I had a visa before and I had to renew it. Um, the lady in front of me, she had all her documents and stuff prepared and she just answered all the questions and whatever. But the thing about a visa application is that they've already decided if they're going to give you a visa long before you come for the actual interview. The interview itself yep. is really just a formality. And so this lady would have spent however many uh, well, I think it's a thousand and something TT dollars, um, which is about 150 US. Um, so she spent that much money to, you know, pay for this. And of course, they don't give you any money back. And so she paid for the whole application process and she got her documents ready and she came for the interview and she answered all the questions and she was just denied. And just like that, that's it. You're, you're, you're entirely cut off from moving freely to that part of the world just because this settler colonial state says you cannot. 
Another thing that makes it worse is that in Trinidad, at least, because we are in the Caribbean, a lot of connect and flights go through the U.S. And if you're not allowed to enter the U.S. at all, it makes it very difficult to travel, to go where you need to go. It's it's weird, the difference between, like, now Aotearoa doesn't have land borders because we're just um, several islands in the ocean, whereas U.S. Mexico has this highly militarized uh, land border. So like the no more, the no border movement hits a little different when there's no land land border. But oh, yes. obviously there's still this, this like visa uh, nationalism kind of thing. What makes it also interesting in Trinidad is we are also an island nation, a, a twin island nation, but we are literally right next to Venezuela. And so during the Venezuelan crisis, a lot of Venezuelans have come to Trinidad because it's like a five minute boat ride. And so it really highlights the unity of borders because it's practically impossible to enforce that kind of, um, to restrict that kind of movement when there's such closeness between people. And especially since for centuries prior to colonialism, there's been like a constant exchange between the South American mainland and the entire Antilles. And so the fact that these, these these states just come and set up shop and say, oh, well, you can't move anymore, it's, it's absurd. It's a flagrant violation of the freedom of movement that people have enjoyed for generations. It's just so obviously a protection of imperial capital, like, and increasingly so as the climate, climate crisis, like, continues. It's like... We need to ensure that the people who suffer from extractive colonialism uh, cannot seek access to resources that are being hoarded by the colonizing countries. Uh, <laughs> it's just so like obvious. I so I I was born in uh, France, but I don't have the citizenship. Um, and I, I, I always found it, and this is one of those things that I kind of understood retroactively, but that, I mean, in retrospect, uh, so I was born in France. I have like French cousin, like French citizen, like you know, cousins who have the French citizenship. And I also have cousins who have the Swiss one. And my dad is a naturalized uh, Swiss citizen as well. And so every time I wanted to visit, um, let's say my father growing up, I would have to go to the Swiss embassy in Beirut and apply for a visa. And they would always give you a pretty short term one. Like I remember once I got one, I was going to visit him for like 15 days and they gave me one for like 17 days, something like that. And at some point it, it just dawned on me of like, so the contrast that I, w I or the example I wanted to give is that like the fact that I would come to this continent essentially where I started my existence, but every time I wanted to come to it, to physically be in it, I had to ask someone someone's permission and obviously I have to pay a shit ton of money because the visa application as Andrew mentioned uh, tends to be quite expensive and when I went to the UK the first time around my first visa was fine like the first visa application was okay but then the second time around when I reapplied to essentially I had to go back to Lebanon to then reapply for the visa I was in the UK but in order to do the PhD in the UK I had to go back to Lebanon and apply for the visa again to go to the UK and so that process was basically first time around, I mean, the second application, but the second time I applied, they said no, like they rejected the visa. And the, the reasoning they gave is that they were not convinced of my level of English. And that's after I got a master's degree from a UK university. <laughs> and um, so the second time around, I applied with the exact same documents and they determined my English to be sufficiently good enough for me to then go to Scotland. Um, and for me, it was just that. It, for, I, I just interpreted this as like, well, this is obviously just a money scheme. Like I just applied for a second visa again. I had to pay all over the, in the same documents, all of that stuff. I had to pay for it again. And they don't reimburse you, as Andrew mentioned. And it's something that people who are in Europe, who have the citizenship in Europe, um, with the exception of racialized folks who can still be stopped even even if they have the, the citizenship of their respective countries. But many people here really take it for granted. And I've always wondered what that's like. 
like I'm not, I don't even know if like that's envy necessarily, but I I don't know what it's like to have this site like this um, big space that you can just go from one area in that space to another area in that space. And if you're stopped at best, you can just say, hello, officer, and then you continue and no one bothers you. I don't know what that's like. And that's I mean, something that really baffles me. Like, you know, the U.S. mostly don't have to pay for visas, right? If you're a U.S. citizen, you mostly yeah. don't have to pay for visa applications. And U.S. imperialism is really wild, too. You can go like 100 miles into Mexico without ever showing your passport. Um, or without passing any kind of border security. There's just like a dude sitting on a chair asleep or like looking at his cell phone if you're going south. But if you're going north, it's like a three-hour wait at the border. Um, yeah, same between Europe and North Africa. You know, there's the enclave in uh, northern Morocco, which is a Spanish enclave. And you can do the boat ride from like southern Europe to north africa and that's fine there's no danger there you're totally safe and everything but obviously if you're in north africa and you're trying to reach uh, southern europe you can literally lose your life and we're talking about a a distance that in ancient times like uh, you know the ancients as we call them were describing those as like as nothing you know the, because it's just it's the the, the landmass especially around gibraltar isn't even that you know, big, but it's militarized. So that's what makes it big. It, it's geographically small, but politically, it becomes a, a like a, a huge distance, if you see what I mean. It's interesting that we all kind of stumbled into this meatiness of thinking about borders and freedom of movement. And um, I'm wondering, like, there's the endless of how bad it is that we could talk about and analyze and examples. You know, I kept thinking about how borders often cut across indigenous territories that have been, you know, in Southern Arizona, it's like 6,000 years of continuous inhabitants cut by a border mm -hmm. now cut by a wall. Mm -hmm. And then that wall like changes the cultures on both sides. Um, but I'm wondering if there's something like positive or beautiful that this traumatic infrastructure has caused us all to believe in. Like, there's something about freedom of movement. I feel like there's something more there that we are all imagining. Maybe it's like a form of resistance to imperialism or something, or like interconnectedness of peoples. Mm -hmm. And so I was just yeah. wondering if that uh, was something for you all. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. I just see this as, as such an Im impoverishment of... And like the pot the potential of life can be so much more interesting, and it is just being limited by these relatively arbitrary concepts and social constructs, whose purpose is to essentially keep certain people out and keep certain people in. Uh, essentially, the metaphor of a fortress, which you know in Europe, fortress Europe has become pretty popular term to describe this phenomenon. Um, but that's why, like I, I've always had this fascination with reading old and by old i mean like maybe a hundred years old not even not even that much older than that but you know even reading something like the orient express the that that book by agatha christie and just the idea that you could do that like you could just you could be on a train from jerusalem or wherever it left from and you go to i think istanbul and from istanbul you can take a train to go to paris like today that's insanity you know like you you literally i mean in the sense that it's impossible to think about that like I, my brain has difficulties even conceptualizing something that isn't that complicated uh, distance wise. If you're in the southern border of Lebanon and, and like Israel, Palestine, you're closer to Haifa than you are to Beirut. And the train distance would be like, I don't know, 40 minutes maybe between Jerusalem and Beirut if there was a train. But because of the border, it's impossible. It's it's just not it's something that you can even I personally I have lots of difficulties even imagining something like that being the case. Well, it was the case just like two generations ago, or three generations ago. I feel like you were going to I'm going to have to cut out and I, I, you guys can do whatever you want. I know that you were going to ask me about books. Mm -hmm. Can you are you do you have time to recommend three books? I simply do not read, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just my like work and the world is so intense i mostly just listen to joy 
like interesting, distracting audiobooks while I'm cleaning or doing childcare or something. So like the audiobooks I've listened to recently were this book called Hench, which is about a temp agency for uh, villains. Um, I just read, I've been reading a lot of graphic novels. I just read this graphic novel called Private Eye. Um, and I really like the author's work. Unfortunately, they use like the R slur a fair amount in everything I've read about them, which seems absurd considering they also have like trans characters and stuff, whatever. Um, I'm reading this book right now called like Light from Uncommon Stars. It's like queer sci-fi weird thing. I just, I just read for distraction. I, d I don't read for becoming more depressed these days. <laughs> I mean, I think that's fair enough, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, Y'all are so sweet. I always learn so much from both of you. Um, Andrew, if you want, I figured I have I had like two more themes I wanted to explore with the three of us. But if that's OK with you, we can do it just like the two of us. Sure. Um, one was like we, we kind of talked about it last time you were around, actually. But on on solar punk, which obviously is a is a topic that I actually I think on this podcast specifically was first mentioned by Emmy, if I'm not mistaken, and the and the when I asked them to recommend books. And they said something along the lines of like anything solar punk or Afrofuturism because and here I'm paraphrasing um they said something along the lines of I just I'm amazed at people still finding hope despite everything or something along those lines. And I guess I just wanted to ask you um and and also I want to say like after they said that, I think one of the things I did was just like type in solar punk on YouTube and I found your video. Uh, and then obviously I had you on as well on the podcast. Can you talk more about um, your your uh, journey into solar punk, if that makes sense? And do you, do you see this as a, a framework alongside anarchism or which maybe complements anarchism or whatever, which allows you to maintain hope, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, for me, I just kind of came upon Solar Punk through Tumblr and just liked it and sort of inspired some of my um, my earlier offline projects. But in terms of, you know, its intersection with anarchism, I think that anybody who is inspired by Solar Punk ideas um, who, you know, really digs deeply into the motivations behind Solar Punk, why Solar Punk has uh, an aesthetic, has come about, why, um, what Solar Punk espouses as its values. I think anarchism is a natural conclusion. I don't think you need to be an anarchist to, um, to you know, hold to Solar Punk values, but I think that if you're not, not at least leaning towards... Um, libertarian socialist um directions you know decolonial directions um egalitarian directions you know direct democracy of some sort if you're not like you know looking to establish the commons as opposed to I, I, you know uprooting the concept of private property i'm not sure that you have fully investigated the natural conclusions that solar punk would bring about so what I want to say on, on solar punk specifically, like the thing that kind of um, got me into it, if you want, or that kind of persuaded me to explore it a bit further is um, like I do cultural studies. And so one thing that I do a lot is pay attention to media, watch movies, watch series, that sort of thing, and try to understand as much as I can. Like what are the underlying themes? What What's like, you know, um, dominant tropes, what are certain th stories that we tell ourselves, or what are certain stories that are dominant in popular cultures, that sort of thing. And one very common, or one very obvious thing about, uh, and almost a lot of movies, almost all movies that have to do with predicting the future, uh, whether it's like, you know, apocalyptic or dystopian or what have you, even cyberpunk, the vast majority of them tend to be very negative in one way or another. Yeah, like the the idea of a future, like just the representation of the future in quite a lot of movies tends to be essentially saturated with, um, you know, cyberpunk, apocalyptic stuff, uh, dystopian stuff, you know, that sort of thing. 
And to be honest, I just got really tired of it. I mean, I'm not against dystopias or what. I think they can be quite useful uh, if they're done well. Like, you know, Octavia Butler's uh, stories would be an obvious one, uh, an obvious example. But I just needed something else. I needed something that after watching it doesn't just leave me, you know, feeling helpless and paralyzed and 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 whatever. Um, and that's what sort of brought me into solo punk, really. Like, I, I feel like my origin story, so to speak, is actually pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Um, and since then, I've been interested a lot in... I, I love writing as well, but I'm not very good at the fiction aspect of it. So I'm trying to develop the non-fiction aspect of it, like uh, sort of also what you do on your YouTube channel, uh, trying to understand, like, where can this take us? You know, where I'm currently finishing writing an essay for New Lines on solo punk which would probably be out by the time this episode is out, actually. So I'll link it in the description or people can look it up. Um, essentially, like on the power of solar punk, like why, why, why do I feel like this is something that gives me energy, essentially? And needing something that gives you energy is I feel something that still tends to be, and I don't know what you think about this, Andrew, but I feel like it's still something that's like underappreciated in a lot of, you know, activist circles, lefty circles, what have you, like just the needing something that, fuels you um yeah just that really <laughs> fuels you with some positivity in order in order to be able to deal with the shit of the world right yeah that is definitely a necessity because without something to drive you you know it's like you're just really <laughs> waiting for burnout to happen exactly and i i i'm 31 now and i've been taking part in like protests and whatnot roughly since I was like 19. And I think I can think of so many people who started roughly around the same time or even started later, especially in Lebanon, but not just in Lebanon, who are like completely burnt out now, who are unable to do anything, unable to take part in anything, you know, pretty cynical a lot of the time, or at, at the very least very pessimistic, um, which, you know, pessimistic, honestly, is fair enough. Cynicism is a very understandable uh, feeling um, for me. It's something that I'm very familiar with, but I, I always try and fight back against it, or at least in my case, try and push back against it because I feel like it's a, um, like it just, I, I, yeah, it just, it's a very debilitating, if that, if that's, I don't even know if that's the correct word and I hope it's not problematic, but it's definitely something that made me, makes me feel paralyzed. Uh, like unable to deal with the world really when I when I end up feeling cynical it just ends up being this like fuck everything everything's pointless everything's dumb I'm just gonna withdraw you know whatever and that I don't I don't find that to be quite productive I, I think it's okay to go through phases and even days and whatnot where it's like you know fuck everything and you just want to withdraw I think that's fine and that could just be your body saying like yeah take a step back and and whatever but I certainly don't think this is something that should be the main thing or the main framework you approach the world from, if you see what I mean. And for me, solar punk alongside, as I said, at the beginning of our conversation, like alongside anarchism, alongside feminism, alongside so many other things is like one tool among many. And it's something that allows me to enter conversations that otherwise I think, um, wouldn't be accessible in the same way, if that makes sense. I, I have been in situations in the past few months, I've been trying this out, because when you say I'm an anarchist, or when you say or oh, anarchism, if you say that word, many people just assume something and they kind of turn off, like just don't listen or they don't. It's something that is already saturated with a lot of imagery in a lot of like popular culture or whatever. But if you say like solar punk, if you say like, you know, yeah, I've been getting into the solar punk thing, I'm talking about it, I'm writing about it. So much of the time I've I've actually gotten you know, positive looks or curiosity, you know, like, oh, what is that? Can you, can you, can you, what, what does that actually mean? Can you talk about it? And so on. And, you know, sometimes doesn't people just, uh, yeah, they zone out after that. But other times I feel like it clicks with some people and that that's powerful. Yeah. Simple as. I think what people don't realize and as in itself, you know, getting all hung up on these you know, ideological titles and labels and, and figures and whatnot. What people are just looking for is something to inspire, something to push them to be better and to make the world better. Okay, so to sort of wrap up, um, I wanted to ask you this, like, what gives you hope today? Um, 
I'm, I'm very much a planner. Um, in fact, recently I was doing some cleaning because I was doing some moving and I found some old books of mine and I saw that, you know, from my early teens and even going back, I, I had these, these lists going year by year, planning everything I wanted to do. And of course, some things have changed. Some ideas have changed. What I want to be has changed. But the general outline has been pretty consistent. And so I think what gives me hope, um, despite all the issues in the world right now, despite the overwhelming um, sense of calamity, despite the fact that while I could never change the entire world, the best I can do is, is affect as much as I can where I can. What gives me hope is that that recognition that while I cannot necessarily change the entire planet, I can change my corner of it and the people that I touch. What gives me hope is the sense that I at least have some sense of direction of what I want to do, where I want to go, what I want to be. Um, and so that gives me a sort of rudder. It, it gives me something to look towards to guide me even when I feel a little bit lost. And so having that sense of direction is, I think, what gives me hope. One of my major goals that, that keeps me going, that, that gives me hope, other than the the book that I've been writing, uh, which is about the Caribbean past, um, present issues, and, and future-oriented solutions, um, more information on that should be coming out once I've finished it, um, is the project that I think I've had for a very long time now, in some form or another, even before I heard about permaculture, which is this idea of establishing a sort of hub upon which like other activities could sort of spread out of a sort of like a home base um, where permaculture practices could be expanded and established and used to educate others and spread those ideas and to sort of be the first of uh, of many um, to sort of try and kick off a movement for food autonomy and political autonomy and education um, on these islands. And so that that goal is what's keeping me going. And I'm, I'm still in the early stages of it. I'm still in talks with a lot of different people, um, still thinking about how I would go about funding it. But mm -hmm. it's definitely something that, an idea that excites me and, and, and keeps me hopeful. It's my little solar punk pet project. Amazing. That's amazing. Um, okay, well, I mean, on that note, uh, since we're talking about a book, what are, th what are three books that you would recommend to, to your listeners and why those three? Um, for one, and I think I recommended it the first time I was on here, um, Anarchy Works by Peter Galilus. Just because it's such a great general overview of uh, a lot of the common questions um, that people tend to have about anarchism. I'd also like to shout out Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. Even though it's not um, it's, it's not a new book and it's not it's something I only read quite recently. What I find interesting about it with, with, while reading it is that a lot of the ideas that he was talking about, even before I, I read his work, I had had those ideas and I discussed those ideas in some form um, in my written works in the past, my videos in the past. And so it's just really interesting to see. And that's what excites me about, you know, all these ideas that people arrive at similar conclusions from different places. Um, we both come from colonial contexts. Paul Freire being Brazilian and me being Trinidadian, but we still came to some sense of how colonial education impacts people and, you know, trying to find an alternative and a path forward. So I definitely recommend that book. It's pretty short. And lastly, I want to recommend Prefigurative Politics by Paul Rackstead because it is such a brilliant overview of one of the most essential strategies uh, and approaches to revolution today, to social revolution today. Because 
lot of people have this sense of revolution that is just, oh, this big flashy moment where we all storm the Bastille and chop off the heads and this eat the rich and this, that, and the other. When the reality is that revolution is more of like a, a slow burning process of, in some cases, yes, destruction. And in fact, in a lot of cases, yes, destruction, because a lot of things need to be destroyed. In other cases, creation, because a lot of things we need to build, a lot of infrastructure we need to put in place before any kind of rupture would be viable. And of course, places of transition where elements of an institution or a circumstance or whatever just needs to be transformed and brought into the control of the masses. And so I think that prefigurative politics by Paul Rexted does a really good job of exploring that aspect of it and, and talking about how we go about with these institutions, you know, putting them in place, you know, answering common objections. And I think it's just an excellent overview of how we do revolution. And I think more people should be reading it, especially this time. Amazing. And where, where can people find you online? So you can find me on youtube.com slash andrewism. And you can find me on Twitter at underscore St. True. And of course, on patreon.com slash St. True. Amazing. Well, Andrew, I, all that's left for me is to really thank you for this uh, amazing conversation uh, with you and Emmy. I'm glad and to be here. I'm sure we'll do something soon together again. Bad. The Fire These Times is hosted by myself, Joey Ayoub. I am also its producer, researcher, writer, and sound editor. If you want to help turn this project into a full-time job, please head out to patreon.com slash times to support it. These episodes are part of a bigger project, which includes resources, a newsletter, and eventually YouTube video essays as well. As always, thank you for listening and take care.